My name is Sharon Manicus. I'm the coordinator of the Student Health Center here at Moore Park College. This is Dina Stevens, and she's um, our college nurse. We're both registered nurses here at the health center. And you're here for QPR training. This is question, persuade, refer. How to help somebody and recognize it if they need help for thoughts of suicide and what to do with that. You'll be called gatekeepers. That's what we're training you to be, our gatekeepers. And um, we'll go through that. This program is data-driven. It's been proven to be very effective. It was developed by Paul Quinette. He is a psychologist in the state of Washington who developed this. So the disclaimer is really this um, goldenrod sheet that you read through, and it talks about your own personal history with this topic. So I just want to ask a couple questions so that we know where we are in this. How many of you, either yourself or know someone who has depression? Okay. How many of you, yourself or someone you know who's had thoughts of suicide? Okay. How many of you have lost somebody to suicide? Okay. What's really important for you to remember is that the training that you're going to learn now is to take you to the future, not to look back, especially those of us who have lost someone to suicide, because we tend to do that. But we want to go forward. What can we do? What's a new tool in our toolbox to be able to help somebody? So I need you to look at it that way. If at any time during this presentation you're feeling uncomfortable, it's difficult to sit through regard, regarding something maybe that you're personally going through, it is okay to get up and leave. Please don't stay sitting here. But it'll be either Dina and I to, we're just gonna check and make sure that you're okay. At the end, um, we'll probably do a little bit of role playing. Role playing kind of takes it up a notch. And so if you're uncomfortable with that, that's okay not to participate. So we'll go ahead and get started. The goals of QPR are, what are the early, recon, recon, recognizing the early signs, warning signs, Excuse me, it's been a long day. Let me re-say that again. Recognizing the warning signs that someone may be thinking about suicide. Bold intervention. Do you think it's easy to ask someone whether or not they're having thoughts of suicide? No. And the people that you're more likely to come in, we kind of have a diverse group in here, are friends, family members. We've got nursing students, you within the hospital, us within our jobs of helping students or in whatever way we come in case with them, but it could be family members. And it does take bold intervention on our part to ask those questions. Early referral. As far as I know, we have no mental health providers in here. We have nurses, we have other um, individuals, but we're not mental health professionals. Dina and I are trained in crisis intervention and know how to respond. Nursing students do get some of mental health training, but you are not the mental health provider, nor is anyone else in the room. So we need to be able to refer them and get them professional assessment and treatment. And to talk about decreasing stigma. To be able to present this and talk about mental health helps to break down barriers of stigma. Do we think there's stigma around mental health? Yeah, it still exists. Not as much as it did in the past, but it does now. And just by us having this training, being willing to have a conversation with someone, decreases stigma of them going forward to get help. QPR is not counseling. You need to remember that, that you're not there as a counselor. You're there as a friend. You're there as an uh, instructor or um, whatever role that you have, but it is not counseling or treatment. Primary person, purpose is to offer hope, and that's just true intervening and doing something. People are thinking about suicide feel things are hopeless, okay? And so you're offering hope by listening and being there. We're gonna learn the warning signs, clues, and suicidal communication. But first we're gonna get into some of the things that we know about suicide from a statistical point of view. For each documented death by suicide, there's an average of 25 attempts. In our youth, you see a major increase in the amount of attempts, and in our elderly, the attempts go down before a completion um, happens. So four attempts per completion for elderly. We have a higher risk of suicide in our elderly as well. So undiagnosed, untreated depression is the number one cause of suicide. So it's really important that we're gonna recognize what those signs and symptoms are so we can help people to get into treatment so that we can head off going towards suicide. 
if someone expresses hopelessness, your radar needs to go off. That's the number one clue that someone is thinking about taking their life by suicide. So if they express that, and maybe you don't have a whole lot else, you should be thinking, I wonder if they're thinking about suicide, and do I need to be going further and asking them questions? So here we have um, scans of the brains. What's the big thing that you notice that's different between the depressed brain on the left and the not depressed brain on the right? There's not as much activity on the depressed brain. Right, not as much activity on the depressed brain. So what would that mean? How's their thought process? It's, it's altered down. Do they make decisions? Do you think their judgment is good? Can they see a big picture? Are they very, very narrow-minded? Okay. It's really important for you when you're, when you're trying to intervene and help somebody, remember this. Because it may seem like, I don't know why they don't see things like I do. This is why they don't. Okay. And you and Dino talk about having to do more sometimes. This is why. So before we go to the next slide, what are some signs and symptoms of depression? Isolative behavior. Okay, they isolate themselves. Maybe used to be more social with family and friends, pull away in a classroom, we start to see students not show up. Okay, what else? Tired all the time. Tired all the time, fatigue, and they haven't done any physical activity. How many of us in this room have had those days? <laughs> Probably all of us, you know, because we're mentally worn. We haven't physically done anything, but these are days that continue for these individuals, and they are very tired, and they may have difficulty getting out of bed. What else? Lack of self-care. Lack of self-care. Not bathing, not taking care of themselves. You're seeing them in the classrooms. They come, they're usually well-kept to begin with, and then you start thing, seeing a change in appearance, even their hair and those types of things. Right. What else? Maybe not eating as much or eating way too much? Right. Sometimes. Eating a lot or not eating very much, both ends of the spectrum. What happens with sleep? Same. Same. Okay. Sleep is on the same spectrum with eating. Sleeping a lot or sleeping very little. And how many of us have pulled an all-nighter where we've stayed up all night? How did we feel the next day? Not so good. We don't function really well add that on to this person's depressed brain, okay? One of the most important things to do to get to, for someone is if they're not sleeping, is to get them some rest and get them some sleep. So hopefully things will become a little clearer. So let's see what we missed. Loss of interest, pleasure, nothing brings them joy anymore, lack of motivation. You know, what about that student that starts out really strong in the classroom? and then it just kind of falls off. What's going on? What's changing? Um, heightened emotions, kind of all over the map. Maybe angry outbursts, frustration, very irritable. And, and maybe this is a person where they've been pretty, moods are pretty stable, and all of a sudden you're starting to see this. You have a patient in the hospital you work with, Mr. Jones, usually Mr. Jones is very friendly. All of a sudden you're starting to see some changes where he's angry and what's going on. And as we go further, maybe he's experiencing some other things. Profound sadness. Um, it's so hard for me to define this, but once you see it, you do. And it's just sadder than sad, and it just doesn't fit the picture of what you would think that that person should be. And I'll give an example of that later. Feeling guilt or shame. We talked about fatigue. They withdraw from families and friends, can't make decisions at all. And they may um, express that they feel things are hopeless or they feel helpless. So I don't know. This would be for our students. Did any of you do our National College Health Survey that was sent to you? Yay, thank you very much. That data just came to me yesterday, so we haven't had a chance to really get it into here yet. So we'll go with the spring 2013. And the National College Health Assessment Survey is put out by American College Health, and it asks a lot of very personal, intrusive questions, our students would agree, about health. But it helps us to find out what are the needs, how can we help our students. And so the questions are posed within the last 12 months, have you experienced any of these things? So in 2013, that was the last time we had done that, 
Um, we see that feeling exhausted, could have been 100%, really wouldn't make me alarmed because I think we all have those mental health days. But going down to feeling hopeless of those students that completed the survey, 47% of them felt things were hopeless. Remember, that's that number one clue. That's a scary statistic to me. When we go down to considered attempting suicide, more Park College students who reported on that, we were two and a half times the national rate. And of those who attempted suicide, we were three times the national rate of college students to do that. So this is an issue and why it's crucial you know, that we're here and being able to teach people how to use QPR to intervene. Um, I briefly looked at our statistics and our numbers are higher. And um, so there'll be more to come on that as we go. From the CDC, there's about 112 suicides in the United States. And um, it has grown to the second leading um, cause of death with in our college age population, the 15 to 24, it's no longer third. Why are, are there more deaths by suicide for males? Why do you think? Because you mean it? Because you mean it? Meaning we're gonna, more force. Yeah, if we're gonna do it, we're gonna do it. It's not like right. taking pills, we're gonna do right. it. Right, it's the means they choose. It's a more lethal means, and usually it's by guns or asphyxiation. We're seeing a rise, though, in women of asphyxiation, which is a little sad to see, but it really deals with the means that they use. So some myths and facts. We wouldn't be here if no one could stop a suicide, so we know that's a myth. How many of you have had CPR? Okay. Are you always able to save that person? Does a person always make it? No, they don't, do they? Okay, same thing with QPR. Person may not always make it. You still may do everything possible that you can and they still may take their life, but it is much more successful than CPR in saving a life. The next one, confronting a person about suicide will only make them angry and increase the risk of suicide. Myth or fact? Myth. Okay, I wanna break it apart a little bit here. If I confront a person about suicide, it will, will only make them angry. Can someone get angry if you ask them this question? Yeah. You need to be prepared that that can happen, okay? Does it change up what you need to do? No. Okay, you still need to follow through to get them help. Um, my whole time here at Moore Park College, I've only had one angry student for me asking them. What you're usually met with is relief, and you're met with relief because you are showing that you've been paying attention to maybe what, what's been going on with them, what they've been saying, you're listening, you're there, you're willing to talk about it, okay? That's huge, that's hope to them, okay? And um, so most times you can just like, kind of see that individual relax a little bit. Also, asking the question and using the word suicide will not plant a seed that that would be a good thing to do in their situation. They just, it doesn't do that. So don't let that hold you up too. People who talk about suicide don't do it. What do you think? Yeah, it's a myth. There are some people who talk more about suicide than others. There are some people that may never say a word about it. Usually there are some signs and symptoms <coughs> at least a couple days beforehand that something's impending, but there have been some where they've never said a word about it, and there are those that talk more about it. But you need to take it all seriously, okay? Um, if a suicidal youth tells a friend, the friend will seek help. You're on the fence. It's because of nursing school. <laughs> <laughs> it's either all or nothing. Yeah. One would like to believe that all, not all youth will keep it a secret, okay? So, but for the majority, the um, friend will not seek help. They do keep it a secret. So if you have um, people that you know that are younger and fit into that 
junior high, high school, we were really good secret keepers there. You know, we didn't tell our parents anything. We swore our friends to secrecy. That's what happens. So they need to be made aware of that there is help and, and that you would be trained in this and could help with that. Do you all know what wearing a mask means? Okay, We're, we all kind of perfect that. And I think in some ways it's a safe place for us to do it. Students who come into the health center, I put this, it says, everybody else seems so happy and normal. I wish I wasn't the only person with mental health issues. When we used to see students in the health center, this is how they feel. Because you and I have all perfected our mask out on campus. And they feel very alone and they're very vulnerable there. But the reality is, Every single one of us goes through good and bad times for many different reasons. Um, and so I just need us all to be mindful of that. And also, we're in positions to see that mask shift with family members, with people that we're close to, working in the hospitals. Patients are very vulnerable. When you build a relationship, you start to see things shift. For our instructors and our staff, you start to see things shift when you build that interaction with the student. Suicide's been called a permanent solution to a temporary problem. We need to remember suicide is not the problem, okay? It's whatever's going on underlying that that is the problem. Suicide is not that. It's the only thing they can think of that will help get relief from what's going on. So we're going to go over some of the clues and warning signs, and obviously the more clues and risk, greater the risk, but take all signs seriously because you may only have one or two. If I had someone that I'd been noticing some behavior and they made a comment about being feeling hopeless, I would be thinking about pulling them aside to talk to them about that and asking this question because that's that number one clue. Direct verbal clues, there's no gray zone here. This is black and white. They have told you what they're going to be doing, OK? Um, and you can read those. I want to draw attention to the very last one. If such and such doesn't happen, I'll kill myself. We had a student who was in a classroom. It was a math class. And he had made a comment to just, I think, probably under his breath. But there were students around her, and he said, if I don't get an A in this class, I'm going to kill myself. Now, there was nothing else that the student had exhibited that seemed out of the unusual. Why would, why would someone make a statement like that? I think a lot of it, it's so obvious that people don't take it serious. If we just use that's a common everyday knowledge, I'm like joking around. Ugh, I'm going to kill myself. I mean, mm -hmm. kind of like that. No mm -hmm. one would do that. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, the students didn't take that approach. What he said is it's like something common someone might say, joking around. In this case, thankfully, they did not do that. But what does a grade mean to students? Everything. Everything. It means maybe where I go to transfer, what it might mean to my family, my parents, to myself. For this young man, um, he wanted to be a doctor, and he wanted to get into med school. Anything below an A was disappointing to his parents. There were some cultural things there. He felt shame, and he felt guilt. Thankfully, the students reported this to the instructor and then reported to us that we were able to get some help for this young man. He finished the semester and went on, but he was fully intent on taking his life from that. And there was nothing else that had been said. So it was kudos to those students to, you know, go further. But yes, you can fall in that trap. Indirect verbal clues are kind of gray zone clues. Um, who might make a statement, my family would be better off without me? What did you say? Hopeless? Mm hmm I want to take this to our elderly, our grandparents, OK? And why would they make that statement? They feel like they're a burden, declining health, maybe feel like they can't contribute anymore. Remember, we had four attempts per completed suicide. They were the highest rate, OK? Um, 
Sometimes we have troubled individuals that feel like their families would be better if they weren't here. Um, I won't be around much longer. What does that mean? Well, my family's moving and this is what we're doing, you know, but it needs, you need to get more information off of indirect verbal clues and explore it. Some behavioral clues, if you know that individuals had a previous suicide attempt, that's one more clue to be thinking. If they're acquiring guns or stockpiling pills and you're aware of that, you know that they've had history with depression or have exhibited signs and symptoms of depression. They have the moodiness and maybe they express hopelessness. Putting personal affairs in order, when is that appropriate to do that? What? When you're about to die. When you're about to die. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I would think that might be appropriate for my age. Okay? Because I'm trying to, and I'm not getting ready to I die yet. <laughs> but putting personal affairs in order, you're right. We're approaching an age, wanting to make sure things are financially set up, things are ready for maybe our kids or things like that. That would be an appropriate thing to do. If a 22-year-old gives away a necklace to a friend that her grandmother gave her that had been in their family, would that be appropriate? Now, that's giving away of a prized possession. You need to look at the appropriateness of what is going on, okay, and, and um, from that standpoint. Someone who has been in recovery and relapsed from drug or alcohol has a 60 to 70 percent higher chance of taking their life by suicide. What happens when we drink or use drugs? It messes with your thought yeah. Messes with our thought process. We're more apt to take a risk and our judgment is more impaired than it was before. What are some risky activities? And I want to look at risky activities for college students. So what are some risky activities you can think of? Sexual intercourse, drugs. Sexual intercourse. And, um, why would that be risky? What would make it risky? STDs, unprotected, unprotected. Okay, STDs, unprotected sex. How we look at it from in the health center is what's the change of behavior for that individual? One partner to 50 partners to 20 partners. What is going on? Not using protection, maybe um, um, sex with same-sex partners, things that are changing that are putting them at a higher risk, right? What are some other risky activities? Picking fights. Picking fights, yeah. Drinking and driving, Drinking and driving. right. Hopefully, um, most of our students use designated drivers, but if I changed and no longer, I go to a party, but now I don't want to use that, changed my risk, didn't it? What if I go to the party and I'm usually the designated driver, but now I start drinking? changes my risk. Where if I go to a party and I've usually drink no more than two or four drinks, but now I'm drinking more, or now I'm starting to use drugs, has my risk changed? Yeah, we're looking for changes in behavior that way. Any other risky activities you can think of? Substance abuse. Substance abuse. Driving fast, racing. Mm-hmm. Cliff diving is another one that we hear under the influence. I think about, there are people that are real risk takers, and, um, but when the risk takers take away some of the um, protective measures, it changes it up, okay? Okay, situational clues. Being fired or suspended from school or a job uh, death of a spouse, a child, or a friend by suicide. We have to be very careful in <coughs> watching that because they might be thinking of taking their life by suicide. Diagnosis of a serious or terminal illness. We've had legislation recently that has um, allowed someone to take their life by assisted suicide who is, fits in that situation. And um, loss of financial security. When our economy kind of tanked here a few years ago, we saw individuals who lost their jobs, came home, and took the lives of their family and then their own life. So that happened just as a result of that. Humiliation, bullying, exploitation. Where does that take place? Does it take place on a college campus? Yeah, everywhere. It does take place on a college campus. We do have that. Primarily, we see a lot of it in... Um, junior high, high school, but it does occur here. 
And it also occurs on social media. We have seen people take their lives by what has been posted on social media. So I encourage you to look, if you're someone who posts things or writes things, be very careful about, you know, it's very easy to put something out there and we don't know the state of the person who's reading that. So be careful with that. Uh, loss of a major relationship. I, I want to tell you a story about a student we had many years ago, and it was before, believe it or not, cell phones were here. So that'll, that'll <laughs> add into this a little bit, because with cell phones, we're a little more accessible, aren't we, than, than we were back before those. And it really wasn't that long ago. But um, a student was in an art class, and he had been watching a film, and uh, started to tear up. So the instructor brought him over to the health center because she needed to teach her class. And, and this young man obviously needed some help. So I met with him, and um, I would describe him as profoundly sad. He proceeded to tell me uh, about his good friend, who was also a friend of the family, who took his life by suicide. He told me every detail of his friend's suicide, every specific detail. This young man, I spent probably a good hour together and we were just sort of talking about what, what is his support system. I couldn't do anything about the friend, but I needed to take care of this young man. And he told me he'd been speaking with the youth pastor at a local church in Camarillo. So I got the name of the church and who he was talking to. I also had the name of his good friend that had passed away. And um, after about an hour, he felt safe and I felt safe to let him drive home. So when he left, you ever get that gut feeling that something's just not quite right? Well, I had that gut feeling and uh, I decided I was gonna call the church because I wanted that youth pastor to, to talk with him that night. I thought that would be great. That was his support system and a great avenue. So I called the church and I got the senior pastor and explained who I was and who I was concerned about and that he had been in contact with the youth pastor. And he said, there's no way possible. That youth pastor has been gone for the last two to three weeks on a family emergency, hence prior cell phones. Okay, so he would have had to pick up the phone to the church or to his home. There was no other way that he could have reached him. And, but the senior pastor agreed to call him because he knew who he was. Well, that made my gut feel much worse because this young man had just told me this is who his support person was and now I knew there was no way he'd been in contact with him. So I decided I was gonna go ahead and call the home. And I got his sister who answered the phone. I explained again who I was and I said, I'm so sorry for the loss of your dear family friend. And I said the name. She goes, you know, I don't know what you're talking about. He was just at our house last night. And I said, has your brother recently broken up with his girlfriend? Yes, how do you know? And he has been acting so strange. He won't come out of his room. He's angry. He doesn't want to do anything. All those kinds of signs and symptoms we've been watching. And I said, are your parents planning a trip this weekend? How do you know all these things? And, and I said, are you and your brother having a party? She goes, yes. What this young man had told me was every detail of his own suicide that he was planning for that weekend. And, um, and it was because this 18-year-old student had broken up with a girlfriend that he had dated since he was 15. And he felt like his world had ended and um, didn't see any hope in going forward. So the good part about it, parents were great, and Dina will talk a little bit about parents in a little bit, but parents were great, and we got in and got some resources for this young man. He finished the semester, he graduated and moved from Moore Park. But the part for me that threw me off on him that I was really concerned was a profound sadness. And um, he had lost his good friend and I understood that. But there was just something that just didn't set right with me. And so I would encourage you when something doesn't feel right, probably isn't, listen to that internal voice say, I need to follow up or I need to do something different in this situation to help somebody. So the other part about loss of a major relationship, and I, I like to, to, because I've been guilty until I met this young man of making comments to 
individuals, maybe when they've had a breakup and I know that the other person really wasn't a good match or it wasn't a, and we say, you know what, someone's going to treat you much better and you really deserve better and so forth. That's not what we want to be saying. What we want to be saying is, how are you doing with this? How are you feeling about this? Because it doesn't matter what I thought about this person. It matters what they're thinking and what they're going through. So changing how we talk and become listeners and um, listening to their pain and what's going on. I put this slide up here just for you to know that someone who is thinking of suicide that usually lasts for you know, it can, a few days, few hours, but eventually they'll get over the hump of having suicidal thoughts and, and about taking their life. But stable is kind of a word. We're all different. We all have different stables in here. I can have depression, clinical depression, and be stable. Maybe I stop taking my meds. Maybe something triggers something. My stable changes, right? For that young man in the relationship, no history of depression. For that young man in the back of the classroom regarding the grade, none of that. But something happened that changed their whole world that felt things were hopeless, OK? Needing to get some intervention, which is where um, we need to come in here and intervene and help so that the crisis diminishes, we get them help, they feel hope, and can move forward. So that's the point of that slide. So just know that. But also know that that person that is in that place, they're not going to see this like you and me. But you need to remember that in intervening. So does anyone have any questions about what I presented? Because I'm going to turn it over to Dina, where she's going to actually take you through the QPR part, and um, we'll go from there. OK, so now we're into a set of steps of what's the actual process. Sharon got all the statistics and details and things we should look for. But what do we actually do? So QPR stands for question, persuade, and refer. So we're kind of, we pay attention to our friends, our families, our students, our patients. We pay attention to that stuff. And what we're looking for is a change. We know most of their baseline. What we're looking for is their change. So if you see someone, you know someone that's not acting kind of their norm and you have some suspicions, don't wait to ask the question, okay? Sharon's situation is like the perfect situation. We couldn't have written it better is that had she waited, that was a Thursday afternoon that happened, had she waited until Monday and said, hey, you know what, I'll check in on that student on Monday, I'll see what they're doing, he probably wouldn't be here. So use that instinct to, to go ahead and ask that question sooner rather than later. Be persistent. Remember, there's a lot of stigma attached to this. This is hard for people to talk about on both sides. So people are not always forthcoming about, yeah, I'm having a really rough time, I want to end my life. So push through it. Okay, continue to ask the question until you feel like it's been answered. Okay, I'll do it in a private setting. We don't have to figure that one out. Allowing a person to talk freely. This, notoriously, my hardest part, because I like to talk, okay? But this is so hard because they don't think the same way we do, right? Remember the blue light, right? They're depressed. They can't process the same way. So being quiet, sitting back, and hearing what they have to say in the way they need to say it is so vital. Not easy, but vital, okay. So plenty of time. Again, Sharon's situation is perfect. You know, an hour here, half an hour on the phone, 20 minutes on the phone, getting help. I mean, we're in a four or five hour situation already, okay? Resources, we'll talk about resources in just a few minutes. Asking the question how you do that is less important than that it gets asked. Much rather have you kind of fumble over it and get it out than not say anything and have something happen. Okay, so Sharon talked about people that might say something directly. I'm going to kill myself, right? Pretty direct. Same with asking a question, is that there's a direct way and an indirect way, right? And so much of this has to do with relationship and personality. Relationship with somebody that you're, that you're talking with, whether it's a patient, the way you talk to a patient or a student is going to be very different than the way we talk to our family members and our friends. Okay? It's just naturally that way. Our own personality. Some of us are outgoing and kind of tend to be out there, right? Some need a little more time and encouragement to move forward. No bad way, just different, okay? Are you thinking about killing yourself? Pretty direct, right? Not black and, you know, no gray area there. Kind of got to answer that question at some point, okay? But there's other ways to, to get that question right. Are you thinking about ending your life? Some people don't like the word killing. 
Some people don't like the word suicide. It's totally, that's okay. I'm fine with that. If you can't ask the question, find someone who can. It's okay not to be able to ask it, okay? There are situations, no matter how great we think we can do this and we're ready to go, that it just doesn't feel right and we need some help. And that's perfectly fine, okay? Less direct, okay? So maybe this is the route you need to go. Maybe you're feeling kind of like, I need a little courage here, I'm gonna, Tell them what I've seen. You know what, I, I notice you're not seeming like yourself. Maybe they haven't been in class. Maybe um, they weren't in clinical the other day and you kind of notice some things that are off, okay? You, you seem really unhappy. What's going on, okay? Give them a chance. Man, that sounds like things are really rough. You must be really unhappy with that. Are you so unhappy you've thought about ending your life? We're at the same exact place as the other question. Are you thinking about end, killing yourself, right? We just did it in a different way. Okay? Do you ever wish you could go to sleep and never wake up? Okay? You might hear this in the hospital. I always tell Sharon, yes, on Monday I would like to go to sleep, and on Friday I would like to wake up at 12 when I get off work. <laughs> never works out that way. So, this one we try to avoid. And I said there's no bad way. This one we just try to avoid. Why would we try to avoid? You're not suicidal, are you? Because could just shut down. Could, right? There's a, no, right, there's very leading in this, right? You know? Absolutely. What else? Yeah, there's judgment in this, huh? Right? Like, you're not suicidal. Like, crazy people are suicidal. You're not. Right, absolutely. Two things that we try to avoid. Does it happen? I can guarantee you I've done this. <laughs> okay? And you know what? I take a deep breath and go, you know what? That's really what I didn't mean to say to you. I really am concerned about you. Are you thinking about ending your life? Okay? Problem solved. Move forward. It's over. It's done. We just try to avoid it if we can. Okay? So we've asked the question. That's the first step. Okay, for argument's sake, and because this is suicide prevention, we're gonna say they said yes. Could they say no? Sure, absolutely. Somebody could be having a really crappy week, really crappy semester, really crappy anything, and say, yeah, it's really bad, but I'm not gonna take my life over it, okay? Might they still need some help, though? Possible, right? Is that just because you're noticing these behaviors and just because they're not ready to take their life doesn't mean they might not benefit from some more care, okay? So the next step is we've gotta persuade them that they need that care. Okay, because sometimes this is a hard place for them to be. Okay, we're back to that listening piece of what's really going on in their head. How are they feeling about this? How are they perceiving this? Remembering suicide's not the problem. It's what's underlying that's the issue, and that's where we need to go after. Okay, not rushing to judgment. So easy, because we all do it. Oh, I've been in those shoes. That happened to my friend, my brother, whatever. We all do that. It's not about them. It's not about us, excuse me. It's about them. So what is it saying to them, okay? And offering hope, just being there, willing to ask the question, hearing what they have to say, and being in the present in the moment is hope. It's huge for them. They don't feel like anyone cares, and that is definitely a caring situation, okay? So then we've got to ask a few more questions. Will you go with me to get help, okay? That's an idealistic one, right? We're going to go up to the student health center and we're gonna get help, right? We're gonna call the doctor and we're gonna get help. That's idealistic. It doesn't always work that way. You know, 2 a.m. on a Sunday night, it's not always that convenient, okay? Remember, their brains don't work the same way, right? They're not thinking, they may not have motivation, they may not be able to, to push themselves to go get help. So you may have to do more. Will you let me get you some help? Maybe you have to call and make an appointment with a therapist. Maybe you have to drive them there. Maybe you have to pick them up. Okay, you need to follow through, making sure that they're getting where they need to go. We don't want to drop the ball. You promise not to kill yourself until we found some help. Sounds kind of goofy, I know. Um, but this is amazing. It, it's an amazing contract that people will actually go for. And we've had a student that did this a few years ago. And he had some suicidal thoughts, but he wasn't ready to act on them. But he definitely needed some help. But he wasn't ready for help. And so we contracted this. You promise not to kill yourself until... Um, we, you see me tomorrow. He said, yeah, and he came back the next day. We actually did it three days in a row, and he finally agreed to help. So it made a difference. He connected. He, it took him that long to trust us in order to get him help, okay? If they don't agree to any of these steps, you have to do more. You have to get someone else involved. You have to get a, a higher level of care involved. They need to commit to something, okay? Your willingness to listen can give them that hope that we're looking. It makes such a difference. I, I mean, Sharon and I can tell you millions of stories that, of students that come in and feel so much better when they walk out. They'll tell you, I've been in treatment before. It didn't work. I'm here again. Why do I need to do it again? What good is it? OK? 
okay? Two things to this one. What, what if this time is different? Most people don't have an attempt a week ago, okay? Things don't change. Maybe a couple years ago, six months ago, five years, we have 10 years ago, okay? And you're not the same person. If we think about who we were even two months ago, we're not the same person, especially I'm sure you guys are going, oh my gosh, I had a life, I can't even believe it, right? <laughs> I know, I was there. Okay, so things change rapidly. So thinking about that, you know what? You're not the same person this time that you are now, okay, that you were in the past. So therapy, medication, things are gonna be different this time. The other piece is that it did work last time, okay? Otherwise you wouldn't have made it, right? So something that happened last time was, progress was productive, okay? So two things you can kind of tell them, okay? Almost all efforts to persuade someone to live until, instead of to commit suicide are met with relief. Sharon talked about that. The only angry student has been hers. I have never seen one other than the one I heard through the walls. Um, so it really, it, but that's a comforting thought. You know, if you knew everybody was going to be mad when you walked in, people would be really hesitant. But most of the time we're not. You know, they're so, they, you can almost see them. You can just see the relief fall off their shoulders like, oh my gosh, somebody realized I got it. Okay, so huge. Okay, so then we've got to persuade, or then we've got to refer them somewhere. So we've asked the question, we've persuaded them at some point they need help, and we've, now we've got to take them someplace. So it's like CPR. If you start doing CPR and they come to life and they're like, oh, I feel so much better, you go, okay, well, have a good day, right? We don't do that, right? We still get 911, we still get into the emergency room if they're not already there, all that stuff. Same thing with QPR. Even though we get them through that moment, we still need to make sure they get professional care. So we don't want, you know, we get people all the time go, well, I took them for pizza and they felt better. Not what we're talking about, okay? So a lot of them don't believe they can be helped, okay? So that's where the hopelessness comes in, right? So we've got to persuade them that they need help and show them that there are places they can go to get that help. A direct handoff is ideal. The art instructor that brought the student to Sharon and Sharon worked with, ideal, okay? Always happen that way? Absolutely not, unfortunately. Okay, a commitment from them is huge. Yes, I will call my doctor. Yeah, you know what? I will go and make an appointment in student halls. I will see that therapist that I used to see. Any of those commitments are progress. That's telling them that they're, they're willing to make some move, okay? A commitment for them to accept help is still progress. Something verbal that says, yes, I'm willing to make a move to make this better is progress. Okay, but you always want to make sure you follow up on that. They go, yeah, yeah, I'll call them. Okay, well, you don't want two weeks to go by and find out that they never called and they're not feeling any better. Okay, because that's putting them in more risk. <clears throat> um, leaving them um, information, if they will accept that information and go, you know what, I agree to call that hotline, and we'll talk about hotline in a minute. I agree to, um, to call that person, um, or I'll think about that. If I need them, I'll call them. It's once again, progress. Okay, we need a commitment to sobriety, right? Sharon talked about 60 to 70% of people who've been sober, fallen off the wagon, have an increased risk. No, I knew that wasn't right. <laughs> if you have a sober living and you fall off the wagon, it's 60 to 70% increase, increased risk of suicide. So huge, huge jump in changes. So we want sobriety in them, okay? So again, we go back to this, and if they're unwilling to do any one of these pieces, or if you feel they're not being honest with you and your gut level is saying, hey, I don't think they're gonna follow through with this, we need to do more work. We need to get more care faster, and that may involve things like 911, okay? Suicide hotline numbers and crisis teams. Um, love, love, love these. <clears throat> This is the national one, and on the back of the book that you have is actually this national law. Um, number printed. So if you don't know what TTY is, it's the hearing impaired that'll um, interpret for you. This is actually the um, same number, but they get to press one. Veterans have special needs and, spe and require special care, and we want them to get the care that they need and they deserve. So that's why they get a, a, a special line. Trevor Lifeline is an LGBTQ line. Again, special needs, needs specialized care need them to get where they need to get so they're going to feel safe and comfortable. This number is not on that book, so if you want that number, go ahead and jot it down, okay? Ventura County, I just learned today, this number is no longer valid for an adult. 17 and under only. We tried it today. Yep, it already went. So 
This number is great if you have a minor, so somebody under the age of 18. But if it used to be that you could use this number for an adult, they just dropped this. They can't manage it. There's some longer. big changes going on with our <clears throat> mental health system for crisis in the in the county right now. So that's yeah. Okay. And it happened before <clears throat> we had a chance to get it. So it's going to star just so okay. we have future reference. So unfortunately, if you have a young person, this is great. Okay, you can call them and they can talk to somebody. If not, um, we need to do things like 911, and we'll talk about it. LA County has DD Hirsch Mental Health Services. As far as I know, this still has a crisis team. We haven't called them recently. What's a hotline for? Hotline does a lot of things. It's great for somebody who is in the middle of the night and suddenly feeling so suicidal they need someone to talk to and then maybe they don't feel safe with a family member or friend, okay? It's great if you're with somebody and you're not sure what the next step is, which is what happened to us today. We felt like we needed some support, even though we had mental health care providers in our office. We needed some more help and support. So we were calling Ventura County Crisis Team to get some advice. Um, unfortunately, we didn't get what we needed, but patient's OK, and that's all that counts. OK? You could maybe be with somebody that you've talked to or a family member, and maybe you go your separate ways. You go home or you go to bed, and you're like, I don't know whether I did the right thing. You can call them. They will tell you yeah, you did a great job, continue, follow up tomorrow, or no, I really think this needs to be evaluated further, maybe we need to get 911 involved, okay? They're wonderful, they're amazing, they'll give you advice. So you don't have to be suicidal to use a suicide hotline number, okay? Um, crisis teams, I don't know what they're doing in the ERs now, because they used to use, in Ventura County, they used to use this as the crisis team. If they were admitted to an emergency room and they were having emotional problems, they would actually call this team which has been disbanded. So I'm not quite sure what's going on with that. But um, LA County DD Hirsch will actually send a team out to evaluate somebody that if you have concerns, you can call them and say, hey, you know, my friend here is not doing very well. I'm worried they're gonna try and take their life tonight. They've got a gun in their hand and they're really threatening that they just don't feel good and they just aren't sure whether they should do it. You can call them and they will evaluate whether they need to go to the hospital, okay? If it's ever a life-threatening event, it's always a 911 call, okay? We want this to be effective, right? That doesn't take PhD. I want you to live. I want you to, to get better. I care about you. I got your back. I'm here. Whatever words fit that moment that you, they know you're really in this for the long haul, okay? Getting others involved. And this one's hard is that as as student health with a bunch of younger people generally on campus we think okay we've got a young student who needs some help we'll call mom or dad right but a lot of times we've found is that that's part of the issue and so we don't need to involve another person that's going to cause a bigger problem right so in the hospital you know you think oh well their spouse we'll talk to them if that's part of the issue you don't want to pull that one in that's just not a good way to go okay so who might be appropriate in their life that might be able to come alongside in addition to yourself. Also, support for yourself. This is hard. It's emotional. It's draining. It's overwhelming. It's scary. It's so many things. So having someone you can talk to, someone you can process with, and especially if this goes south, someone that can support you is so important. So who is that in your life? Follow it up with a visit, a phone call, a card. Um, there's a TED talk by a young man who was an athlete in high school and big basketball star and did a great job, got all these college scholarships, and he broke his ankle. And he talks about everybody wanted to carry his books and everybody wanted to help him with his crutches and sign his cast. And then he was suicidal. And he ended up hospitalized. And he said everybody just kind of went down the halls like this. Okay? It's that stigma and we've got to stop that. So following it up starts to break that stigma. It starts to say, hey, you know what, I know you had a hard time and I'm here for you. It doesn't change our relationship. Okay. So huge things like that. 911, okay? Obviously, if you're in the hospital, you don't call 911, okay? <laughs> Bad idea. Although, I guess they've done it. So um, anybody that's brandishing a weapon, that's threatening, that is threatening you, threatening themselves, it's a 911 call. We don't need more than one victim in this. It's bad enough, okay? We've seen too many issues where one person takes out another person or a school or a parking lot. What did today? We had a bus station go down in Virginia, I think. I mean, just open fire. So get away. That's the goal. If you know what car they had, what weapon they had, what cars they were driving, what 
direction they went in. Anything you can give the police is advantageous, but don't put yourself in that situation. We just don't want anyone else um, there, okay? At any time, if you were talking to someone, family member, friend, something like that, and you felt like they, it wasn't going anywhere and you weren't gonna get anywhere, 911 is always an option. Ventura County Sheriff's Department, they are uh, crisis trained. What does that mean? It means that they've gone through special training to deal with emotional crisis without using force. So less taser, more talking, okay? Um, CMEPD, the police department's local, I don't know what their training is specifically. always in damage. So if you have to call 911, ask for a crisis trained officer. If they have one, they'll send one to you, okay? Not always happens, but it's always worth a shot. So, so what we do is for role play is we team you up into teams of two, and one person is the gatekeeper. Gatekeeper is the person that's gonna ask the question, persuade them to get help, refer them to somewhere. That's the purple person, right? The green one is the person who's actually suicidal. Okay, there is a list of things on this green sheet that the, the suicidal person needs to get to the gatekeeper, okay? And how as we gatekeepers, how do we do that? We start a normal conversation, right? How do we start a normal conversation, right? How would we talk to anybody? Hey, how's it going? Right, yes. exactly, how you doing? You know, you know, maybe they don't act quite right. Hey, you know, I know you haven't been in class. I'm a little worried about you, what's going on? Okay? As a gatekeeper, we're going to start to do that. As a suicidal individual, you're going to start to give them clues that's going to make them think they should be asking you a question. Okay? So the goal of a gatekeeper is to ask the question, persuade them that they need help, and refer them somewhere concrete. Okay? The pizza parlor is not a concrete place to refer them. Okay? You yeah. laugh, but it happens all the time. So just okay? make Does sure. that make sense? Yeah. So just a simple, hey, how's it going? Okay? Easy, easy breezy, and we're both right here, so we're happy to go through it with you. I give you guys a chance to read that real quick. Yeah, you know yeah, she's so. got a large part to read. So. You guys all done? Ready? Yes. So, for those of you that got through, how was it being the one who asked the question? What was that? How was it being the ones who were asking the suicide question? It was hard. It was hard. I thought it was hard. Yeah, how about these groups? I'm not having thoughts of suicide today. And I was like, okay, so they're in the past, and like how, what to do kind of from there, because it wasn't mm -hmm. like a right now problem. Right, so. and that can happen, mm -hmm. okay? Maybe in the past, so then, you know, how are you doing now because you're having mm -hmm. these problems now? How are you dealing with that? And you could still go down the path of, is there someone that, that you're seeing or for support and go down that path with them? That's good. Um, this scenario is kind of student-based, but when it's on a personal level and you're dealing with someone, it's a little harder to do that and just persevere. And really, you are met with, thanks for noticing. Thanks for being a part and being in my life to get help. I was telling my group over here that I always feel much better once I've asked the question if I think that's what's going on because it immediately gives me the direction of which I need to go. And um, I'm not here to fix the problems I need to listen and then I need to get them the help that they need so it gives me a good direction with that so anyway you've all finished this class so what we need you to do is there's a post test on the back does anyone have any questions about anything though before we end okay if you'll take the post test on the back and then we're going to give you a certificate it's good for three years for our nursing students going into jobs, this is a great thing to put on your um, job applications that you've had it because it's over and beyond. Um, for the rest of us that work here, meet some of those obligations that we have, but I think it helps us to help our students much better and one another and um, do that. So we thank you for staying late and coming yeah, to this absolutely. tonight.